Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, I am keeping our, our web people happy. This is a, a live webcast today, and so we like to start on time so they know when, uh, when we're going to be on and when we're going to be off. But my name is Don Wolfensberger. I direct the uh, Congress uh, series here, our, our final series uh, and our final challenges. Uh, we are pleased to, to be uh, co-sponsoring today's session with the National Capital Area Political Science Association, whose President Frances Lee is tied up in uh, the various ceremonies relating to commencement at the University of Maryland, but she sends uh, her regards to, to everyone. Uh, we're also pleased to uh, uh, say once again that uh, we are grateful to Chevron for co-sponsoring not just uh, this year's series, but about the last five years of series with the, with the Congress project, which I directed. So thank you uh, to Chevron for that. Um, our final seminar, as you know, is on Congress and the global energy crunch. Uh, and as with previous seminars, what we're interested in with the Congress uh, project is looking at the politics and the processes that go into deciding uh, important policy issues in the United States Congress. And so what we try to do is get members who are currently serving or have served or senior staff people, people a as well as journalists who cover the Hill, uh, who know what's really going on behind the scenes. Uh, we try to get some his historical perspective. We don't have a, uh, a particular uh, congressional scholar uh, today as we usually do, but uh, I did give our panelists some background information from uh, a chapter that Bruce Oppenheimer did in a book called Congress Reconsidered uh, on the process hurdles to energy legislation, and he looks back for four decades uh, as to what has changed in Congress and how the process <coughs> changes and reforms have affected uh, policy outcomes in the energy area. And I was just mentioning to Congressman Sharp that we had uh, Bruce Oppenheimer here for, I think, my first uh, energy program at least 10 years ago when uh, he sort of reignited his interest in that subject matter, which he had done his PhD on uh, many, many years before that. And since then, he has periodically been updating that and including it in uh, Congress Reconsidered. So we're grateful for his historical perspective. I think the two things that came out in sort of rereading that and looking back is that process changes have had some impact on how Congress has handled energy legislation. And I think that the big turning point in many ways was when Congressman Sharp came to the Congress, not that he was the, the only person affecting this. We last, our last session on the culture of Congress yesterday and today we had Tom Downey from his class. But that class made a lot of changes that affected the House of Representatives in particular. Uh, among them, they began to uh, elect committee chairmen uh, and that was different from the old seniority system. They actually ousted three or four committee chairmen that uh, did not meet the standards for what they thought should be responsiveness to the party caucus. We saw also in 1975 for the first time what's called multiple referral of legislation. <coughs> Before that, bills went to a committee that had principal jurisdiction and that was it. And the Senate does it much that same way uh, today. But the House started referring bills to multiple committees that had even a piece of that legislation. So I think most energy bills uh, went to at least five committees, maybe more. I, I don't recall, but I do remember the number uh, five being used in Bruce's chapter. But you can imagine how difficult it was to sort those things out. <coughs> and what he mentions is that at first the process changes uh, resulted in a proliferation of subcommittees, a lot more democracy, but then uh, the, the Democratic caucus realized it had to try and pull things together and so they began delegating more things to the leadership to try and pull things together as far as legislation and scheduling and, and coordination of different versions of the same bill. And so that was the other change that we saw happening in the 1980s. Uh, you may uh, recall that uh, with Carter's administration, uh, Tip O'Neill still was dealing with the, the Congress that was quite a bit uh, fractionalized and had to create a select committee to pull together the pieces of the energy bill. I think it was in 1977. Since then, the leadership was able to assert you know, a lot more authority in coordinating. But I think you'll uh, hear something about those changes. Uh, I am not as familiar with the Senate, but some of their reforms uh, followed on the heels of some of the things the House did. On the other hand, as Bob Simon may tell us, the Senate is still very individualistic and goes its own ways on a lot of things. So we're going to hear about the differences between the two houses. And that's another thing that Bruce Oppenheimer mentions in his chapter is the fact that the House might come up with a more comprehensive piece of legislation, a lot tougher and so on, but the Senate uh, had to be more accommodating, had to compromise more and so on, and so a lot of the bills were watered down. 
The conclusion that Bruce came to in his paper, and maybe we'll hear a confirmation or not of that, was that most of the energy bills that, that he studied over the last four decades were incremental in nature, that Congress was never really able to get a, a handle on an overall comprehensive uh, policy for energy, and as a result, we are, we're not able to move uh, towards a more energy independent U.S. In fact, I think he mentions in this chapter that we are as dependent on foreign sources for oil uh, as we ever were, and that Congressman is probably probably in many ways just as incremental when it addresses uh, energy legislation as it ever was. So we're going to hear some of the uh, comments and answers to some of those points and other points from a very uh, stellar panel today. We're pleased to have, and I'll just mention briefly in the order in which they will appear, you have their bios in front of you. But Congressman Phil Sharp, who is now President of uh, Resources for the Future, was a member of Congress from Indiana, uh, the uh, home state of our, our former director here at the Wilson Center, Lee Hamilton. But Congressman Sharp served as a member from 1975 to 1995. He early on established himself as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and uh, moved up to the uh, chairmanship, I think, first of the Fossil and Synthetic Fuels Subcommittee and then to the uh, Energy and Power Subcommittee, if I'm not mistaken. So two very uh, important committees on uh, subcommittees on that committee. Uh, after leaving the Congress, he was at Harvard, the Kennedy School, for many years, and for the last five years he's been at uh, Resources for the Future. Uh, secondly, we're going to hear from David Conover. Uh, David <coughs> is now Senior Vice President as Dut at Dutco Grayling, a, a position he assumed about halfway through this month, as I recall, but I first met him over at the Bipartisan Policy Center, where he was Senior Vice President, and uh, he served uh, there for five years, and before that, it's with its progenitor, the uh, National Energy Commission, on which I believe Congressman Sharp uh, served as the Congressional Chair. But uh, and uh, prior to that, uh, David was uh, both uh, on the House or on the Hill uh, side of the government in the Senate as the uh, Staff Director and uh, Chief Counsel for the uh, Senate uh, Environment and. Public Works Committee, do I have that right? And then he moved on to the uh, administration, the executive branch, where he is with the Department of Energy as an assistant secretary. So we're pleased to, to have uh, David, who uh, answered the call at the last minute when uh, one of our uh, speakers uh, was not able to make it, but we appreciate uh, David uh, being willing to step up to the plate. I always have, uh, uh, and, and Bob Simon will actually be speaking, uh, let's see, third, uh, after uh, we hear from David, and Bob is on the uh, Senate Energy and, let's see if I got this right, Natural Resources Committee. I got to put them together because they're not exactly parallel in the House and the Senate as far as their, their names go. But he got his uh, start, uh, I don't want to say coincidentally, he made a decision as a do having, having a doctorate in chemistry to come to Washington, D.C., and he got mixed up in uh, the chemistry of politics, and uh, one thing led to another, and uh, he did not go back to the, the lab. Instead, he uh, has been here in this lab of, uh, of Washington for, for many, many years, but he started as a science fellow with the Department of Energy and, and worked his way over uh, as on loan, I believe, initially to Senator Bingaman from New Mexico, who uh, has been ranking member on the Energy Committee over there and now is the, the chairman of that committee. But uh, Bob has been on some of our previous programs. He was a, a fellow Stennis fellow, one of the, the honors that, uh, that I had too. So we have a, a good a group of alumni from, from those folks who uh, did take time out of their busy staff <coughs> careers to uh, really get to know each other and get to know some different policy issues. So uh, we were both, I think, pleased to have had uh, that experience. I always line up, and don't feel discriminated against Jennifer, but I always line up our, our journalists fourth because uh, they are the best cleanup hitters, I found out, in trying to pull together some of the things that the other folks have said and, and tell you what they see is going on, which is not always the same. But I think most of the folks here are going to speak very straight to you in, in terms of what they have been through, what they've seen, and so on. But I think the journalists uh, get a good uh, uh, cross-section of uh, members' views when they go about getting their stories. Energy is just one of the many things that Jennifer has covered since she's uh, been on there. But she previously uh, was the uh, bureau chief in Los Angeles for the New York Times. And before that, uh, she started out in New York as the city hall bureau chief, as I recall. And she's also a novelist. So she's got uh, many and varied talents. So uh, anything that she cannot uh, uh, write about uh, in the New York Times, she'll, she'll put into a novel. And who knows? Uh, what, what's going to come out of all that. But with that, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Congressman Sharp, who uh, I indicated to, to him he may either speak from the podium or from his place at the table. That goes uh, to, to all the other members of the, of the panel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Don. I'm uh, delighted to be here. 
frankly, as a former member of Congress, I'm delighted to be invited about anywhere. <laughs> but uh, this is a particularly uh, prestigious organization which is doing, has done and is doing important work in Don's program and trying to figure out what on earth goes on and, uh, on Capitol Hill is a, a worthy endeavor. And uh, it's, it's been a difficult task uh, since the very founding of the Republic. Uh, to figure out how collective decision-making uh, works uh, when uh, most people have the sense that it doesn't. But in <coughs> fact, we do manage uh, uh, to actually do a lot and get a lot done, and uh, much of it actually sometimes turns out to be right and positive, uh, let me say, in an environment that <coughs> where this is almost an unbelievable statement, I realize. Um, <coughs> but uh, what I wanted to do was to, um, and also I'm very pleased to be on the panel with the distinguished people here. Uh, Bob and, and Dave represent uh, the, the kind of high quality of staff work that exists. And high quality staff work is not universal and high quality member uh, work is not universal. But uh, there are clearly some high caliber people in both camps and the sy system would never work at all or anywhere nearly the way it does without uh, staff who have the dig into the, the depth of the knowledge and have the professionalism to work with diverse uh, members <coughs> of Congress and divergent points of view uh, proposition and also with Jennifer whom I've not previously known but uh, uh, is obviously an astute uh, observer uh, of the system and how it works and uh, as Anderson Cooper says probably helps play that function of keeping them honest. Um, <coughs> although I've doubted about some of the people who think they're keeping it honest. Um, well, let me uh, quickly turn to some, I'm going to make some very broad generalizations and then hopefully uh, demonstrate that I actually know some specifics uh, <coughs> as we get into conversation and, uh, and, and discussion uh, here at the, with the group. But uh, Don, I was surprised, uh, and it's a, a very skillful thing you've done in our, our, our identifying the, uh, the international uh, issue as uh, the global energy crunch uh, I assume that was to avoid the uh, tacky and wrong uh, uh, use of the word crisis, which we usually words on energy crisis, so it has absolutely no meaning in our society whatsoever. It's been so abused. But the question really comes <coughs> down to what the hell are we talking about uh, kind of proposition. And so I'm just going to make a very brief stab at a very broad view of what we face in the decades ahead in terms of the global <coughs> energy situation. And I'm going to divide the issues into two broad buckets. One has to do <coughs> with the critical economic question of demand growth. Demand growth on the world scale, and you can take IEA numbers wherever you want, I don't tend to keep track of the numbers, but is clearly scheduled to grow significantly in the use of energy around the globe. Uh, in particular oil, natural gas, coal, uh, and, uh, and any of the fuels that can get into and be developed in the market. Uh, and this is a, a, a huge shift uh, in the <coughs> way it is happening from the way it was 30 years ago and the way people anticipated it would happen. There have been big changes, one, in the size of these markets, and one of the most difficult things in figuring out for American policymakers or anybody else what to do about energy policies is to grasp, which most of I don't pretend to, the magnitude of what's going on in these markets inside the United States and abroad. The volume of oil that's moving around about 82 million or so barrels a day uh, in, the, in the world oil market alone and is being used to feed uh, the modern economies. Uh, and, and the second thing is the huge change in fuels that has uh, undergone. We still talk about coal, oil, the conventional uh, things, but we have new fuels coming into the market and, we, and what we thought was conventional oil and now unconventional oil, just that, that distinction is totally evaporating. Unconventional today, meaning when we go up to tide oil in the Bakken and in the, in the uh, uh, North Dakota and whatnot, and when we go after uh, uh, a frontier oil, in the, whether we're starting to do it in the Arctic or in the deep water drilling uh, in the uh, Gulf or elsewhere around the world. Um, and of course, we're, we're going to see a big change we already have been witnessing in the geopolitics around energy. Uh, because it used to be we worried about <coughs> the industrialized nations back in the 70s and 80s, which uh, included Europe, the United States, and then the scattering of things, including Japan. Uh, but nobody, nobody spoke about 
except every now and then in, uh, in footnotes about the energy needs of the developing world, <laughs> China and India and uh, the places that today we know are radically growing and they're radically demanding uh, uh, more energy uh, uh, sources. And so the question, of course, comes up, uh, and the question of crunch may be applicable here, is, well, is, is the marketplace and the, all the production, is it adequate? Are the resource base adequate to meet this demand and the, all the infrastructure it takes to get it there? And uh, there's always a group of people who are hand-wringing about, no, it's not. And there has always been a camp, it's about 40, 50 years old now, that says the production of oil has peaked or will peak uh, very shortly, first in the United States, then internationally. And these people are not, haven't always been wrong about the theory, but in fact, it has never come to play <coughs> in the way it was predicted, meaning that we simply were on the downside of the supply of oil. We couldn't keep finding uh, more oil to meet the oil de part of the demand uh, uh, in energy. But <laughs> that doesn't mean it'll always be there. And uh, we clearly know that adequacy of supply is going to be a question of how do you keep the supply going around the world. And of course, accompanying these kinds of supply-demand questions in the international political arena is the, the competition for resources, the drive to get them in the marketplace or by uh, political uh, influence uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, and, um, and, and there are just lots of issues that can arise over conflict uh, that might arise over supplies, <coughs> over <laughs> disruptions of supply uh, that the State Department and the United States government and other governments uh, will potentially have to deal with. But one of the hardest things to realize, I already alluded to this in the magnitude of, of what's going on, is our enormous difficulty for anyone to know what the hell is happening and what will happen in these giant markets. Uh, you will hear a lot of speeches, you will hear statistics that sound as if we have a great deal of certainty. But unless something has changed and I've missed it, uh, I would suggest that if you look back over the last 30 years, and some of us unfortunately are able to do that to some limited degree with less eyesight than we had, um, but it is that um, many times predictions have been wrong about what was happening in these marketplaces. And by the way, they were wrong by oil companies, wrong by academics, <coughs> wrong by government. Nobody has had a monopoly on truth, and nobody has been able to totally influence it despite the political rhetoric that goes on in our debates here in this country. For example, just to give you a couple, one is the question of the price of oil. Virtually every serious player in the oil market was caught by the surprise of the huge rise in oil prices that occurred, I think, around 2003 and then around 2004 in, this, in the last decade when the prices went way up. If you go back to the, I don't, I don't, I don't have the dates right, but 202 or, or 203, you'll find that OPEC was saying we've got to get control over this price and we're going to keep it somewhere <coughs> between 20 and $40. That's the range. And it wasn't a year or two later, but what it was up to $80 and then over 100 uh, kind of proposition. You simply in this vast market cannot predict exactly what's going to happen, up or down. And that's the other part of this equation. In the 70s, we made great uh, error in policy judgment because we thought prices were going up. The only argument was, is it this fast or is it this fast? Uh, kind of, you know, that's my view of the, <laughs> the, the curve. Um, it, how fast the prices were actually going to rise. And of course, in 1986, they took a nosedive, again, unexpectedly. Now, there are people <coughs> around who will tell you, well, that's going to happen. And uh, a, a few of them will make write books, and they will have predicted roughly, uh, usually very skillfully, they have predicted uh, very ambiguously <coughs> uh, when it will happen. Uh, but the truth is that uh, any wise government uh, industry or uh, NGO uh, should be very careful about these predictions. And the same with the size of the resource and the availability of the resource. I alluded to the oil situation as we missed that uh, mark and, and been surprised again and again when we got more oil out of oil fields that we thought were depleted. We got new <coughs> areas that we were able to go into. New technologies uh, could get it. In natural gas, as you know, the most radical shift in the last uh, decade has been the sudden discovery of uh, that we could really get the uh, gas <laughs> out of the rock, the shale, 
uh, in big quantities, and this is likely to shape, reshape geopolitics as these techniques are applied elsewhere around the world so that we really don't know what the supply is. In terms of solar, many of us who thought this would be a wonderful thing to have for a variety of reasons, frankly thought it was going to be too expensive and not come into the marketplace, only to be surprised this last decade as the prices fell, as the competition gained, as, as uh, there were policies that helped bring this about, I understand, here and, and abroad. But the truth was the, uh, the cost came down and much more radically than had been predicted by many supporters of uh, solar energy. And of course, technology continues to surprise us and change, whether it's in the production of shale oil, whether it's in the automobile system. I was on the National Academy of Sciences study for uh, fuel economy standards in 2001. And if you look at what it says about the likelihood of hybrids and, and some of these alternative fuels, you will find it in one paragraph where it says, well, it's too early to tell whether this is going to be very significant or not. Within two years, <laughs> hybrids were rushing into the market and having a major uh, impact. So uh, anyway, this, um, this is the first bucket of the supply-demand issues that I think we're going to be dealing with, and it has many ramifications for conflict and national security. The second large bucket is on the environmental side, the impacts. We uh, can do very little in production, distribution, and consumption that doesn't have some kind of environmental impact. Uh, and, uh, and to what degree those are threatening or need to be mitigated is a subject of argument, but the truth is that uh, it's going to be a major part. And I'm just going to divide this between sort of what we used to call conventional pollutants <laughs> or traditional problems, problems like the burning of coal and the SO2 that's in the atmosphere, what it does to health uh, kind of propositions, the toxics uh, the, uh, that uh, get emitted uh, uh, either in water or into the air, the uh, oil spills, uh, uh, whatever. These are sort of the traditional ones. And, and what we have to realize here is while each country takes care of and sense its own responsibility on that, the truth is we've had conflicts in the past and we will have more and more uh, conflicts that are cross border where what you do in your country affects me and my water supply or my air supply. Uh, uh, and because the, the volume of activity is so much greater that what we do in the United States is felt <coughs> in Europe uh, and what they do in China is felt in the United States. And this has the potential for future international uh, argument and conflict over uh, uh, that kind of an issue. But of course, the um, and, and we saw most recently, the, uh, the, as we've moved into frontier oil drilling, uh, with deep water drilling, we're moving beginning out and out of the boundaries, and we're beginning to have major impacts on uh, potential portions of the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and so that we have a stake in how oil may get developed around Cuba and in Mexico, and they clearly have a stake of how we do it on our side of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so because if we now do things in such a big way that the impacts on the environment can be huge, especially when they go awry. And then, of course, the second, uh, beside the conventional and traditional, is now the mother of all environmental uh, questions, which is uh, climate change. And here again, this has to do with the magnitude of human activity has so grown, and with the economic growth in the developing world, <coughs> it's going to be even further. And uh, so that the quantities of CO2 or of methane or the, some of the other greenhouse gases that we're putting up are clearly changing the chemistry of the atmosphere and the chemistry of the ocean. And people can argue over how much of a threat that is or how we ought to deal with it, but very few people today argue that there isn't change underway and that human uh, and energy activities in particular are clearly contributing uh, to that. And this leads to a, a newer, it's not new, but it's a more complicated political institutional problem, and that is how to manage these huge, massive commons uh, where we use, we all have common access to make use of the atmosphere and of the oceans, but none of us have full responsibility over them whatsoever, and we haven't really developed the institutional techniques uh, internationally as to how to uh, control. And frankly, in the past, it didn't matter because you could make the ocean as much of a dumping ground as you wanted. It was just too vast that nobody could do that much damage, and the same with the atmosphere. 
but <clears> given <throat> all that's going on, it doesn't appear that that's any longer the case and that we have to work on it. Well, let me turn from, this is my sort of very quick view of what is the energy crunch, uh, uh, which has uh, got a vast majority of issues that are going to crop up. And by the way, we're never going to, in Congress or in the government or in the international arena, ever say, okay, let's have a grand design here to how to handle all this. That's just not the way we have any human experience that would suggest we'll ever get to that point. Uh, but, that, but these issues are going to arise. The second thing that I want to turn to now is just a few characteristics of congressional um, of Congress decision-making on energy policy. And I'm sure my colleagues will have others, and they may debate these, and I'm just going to quickly uh, tick them off. Uh, and they're, again, generalized over about a 30-year year period. And one of those characteristics is that energy decision-making, I'm talking about big decisions here, uh, really has been quite episodic. Uh, <laughs> there was a sort of a view that it happened only every five years or ten years uh, kind of proposition. It certainly wasn't that we weren't having a grand energy bill that was going somewhere every uh, Congress uh, uh, in the uh, 70s, 80s, well, we did in the 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s. Um, but, of course, in this last decade, in the 2000s, I don't know what you call that decade, um, the, in that decade, <coughs> the, um, we actually had a remarkable situation in this pattern where we had a major energy bill, the Congressman Walker was very engaged in these um, as chairman of the Science Committee, uh, in 2005, 2007, and even on the uh, stimulus package, uh, a major portion of that, in fact, I, I was sort of surprised. I'd never been in, never seen, because when I was in Congress, the opportunity to spend so much money at once on, uh, on <laughs> energy of anything, it was just like, where did all this come from? Um, but anyway, um, we've had these episodes, and of course, they've been billed as comprehensive energy policy because of the hand-wringing was, what's wrong with America is we don't have an energy policy. Well, I won't spend any time on this, but I don't buy it. We have dozens and dozens of energy policies. The question is, is whether they're coherent and directionally and appropriate to our needs. Uh, but if you think Congress and the President and the regulatory systems have been inactive in energy, think again. It's been going on for 40 years. It has been up and down in terms of how much is there. But anyway, these comprehensive bills, really what they have been uh, is, and I think it's, it, it, this is not a, 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 to criticize or sneer at it, I think people misunderstand what comprehensive might be and whether they really want a federal government that is Soviet style that can actually dictate things. I don't think that's what we want. So you've got to decide, what do you mean by uh, a, a comprehensive energy policy? Anyway, they're generally collections of policies that cover uh, the waterfront of a lot of fuels and technologies in order either to promote them or to demote them uh, in the process. The second thing about them, but one should not be dismissed. In fact, one of the things in the summary he gave us was uh, a statement that may or may not be accurate in the book. I'm just, Don, I've taken your summary of the book, was it said until 1978 there hadn't been any major energy uh, legislation following the uh, OPEC, uh, the, the uh, crisis of 73. Well, that's just dead wrong. There were major pieces of legislation <laughs> creating the IEA, the, the FBA, uh, the, uh, uh, creating the CAFE standards, creating a huge emergency powers, uh, all kinds of things that went on uh, prior to, and, and, and worst of all, creating the price control system in oil, um, or keeping it going uh, uh, kind of proposition. But, but this goes to the assumption that these grand energy bills are the way of making decision. In reality, something's going on all the time on some little things, some of them actually significant. Um, but let me turn to second characteristic. What triggers <laughs> these <laughs> Uh, episodes of uh, things. And here, many times, in most cases, it is some foreign event <laughs> which usually has accompanied by high oil prices. That though, when they're spiking, that gets our attention. And my point really here is that when they're triggered by foreign activity and the rhetoric in Congress and the speeches by presidents and everything else are almost always about how we have to get energy independence and how we, and, and the key is the goal of uh, the international situation is what's driving it. The reality of the decision making, the negotiations, and the trade-offs almost invariably are highly focused on domestically. 
What does it do to producers for or against? What does it do to various consuming classes for or against? What does it do to the distribution system and who wins and who loses and who has access? What does it do to the environment here in our region or your region, the kind of thing? In other words, it is domestically needs and politics that dominate, despite the rhetoric sounds like uh, it's all about uh, uh, the international situation that caused it. Uh, and price is the one of the biggest drivers uh, toward activity uh, uh, in the Congress. Now, let me give you the quickest exception to this. In, in the 70s and again in this uh, last decade, the energy bills were very much focused on natural gas. And that was pretty much a domestic proposition because it had to do in the 70s, we had a screwball uh, regulatory system on price that shortchanged the interstate market finally in terms of supply. And uh, we had to undo that because the uh, supplies were not available to meet the, the needs in the interstate market. That's my state <laughs> uh, where it's not produced. Uh, and so we had to finally change that system. Well, oil and gas are not totally separable <coughs> from each other because they're substitutes for each other and because the prices do tend to get in line to one way or another, but they are quite different. And so we have a, a very low natural gas price at the moment in the United States compared to the international gas price because you can't, you, it's not easy transported uh, except by pipeline uh, and LNG. So anyway, they, but the point is those natural gas prices in this decade, of course, the natural gas prices started at very high level <coughs> as uh, we discovered that the, uh, the electricity industry had built all the, uh, the uh, electric generation on uh, natural gas and they were suddenly driving up the price and we weren't getting new supplies until the breakthrough on, um, on, on shale gas. And notice here about the predictability of what we know. This is a classic example. When they were uh, doing the 2005 Energy Act, when they were doing this 2007 Energy Act, and I think even as they were doing the 2009 uh, stimulus package, you still had a basic assumption that this, the supply of natural gas, domestic supply, was limited. And we had to do everything we could to open up our market to liquefied natural gas from abroad. Many of us bought into that theory and everything. Now they're trying to say, well, gosh, these terminals, we don't need them. Do we turn them around? Can we export the gas? And of course, the question in people's minds that have gone this route before is, is this now for real? I mean, you know, this whole new supply and everything like that. But it's, it's why policymakers, academics, and everybody has to constantly keep their mind open and their ears open and learning about what's there and be very careful about being trapped by last year's conventional wisdom on energy. Well, excuse me, I'm taking too much time here, but I wanted just to mention a, a, a couple other um, uh, uh, things here. In addition to uh, the, the trigger is often the prices. Um, um, <coughs> in fact, it's the blowtorch on the rear end of Congress. Uh, and believe you me, all kinds of ideological constraints on the left or the right go out the window because the need politically is to demonstrate you are doing something. It can be quite irrational, but at least you're acting, which is better than sitting and twiddling your thumbs in American politics. Uh, and while there are always some rational voices around in both political parties, the rush is for action. And let me suggest to you a, 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 what, what some people would probably like to dispute. <coughs> the intervention in the marketplace under President Bush, the Republicans, and then the Republicans and the Democrats in the 2000s was more similar to what happened in the Carter administration than it was to what happened in the Reagan administration. Now, partly the Reagan administration, after a couple of years, benefited from the huge drop in the oil price. We all benefited from it, from the 86 uh, price drop. Uh, so they didn't politically have to deal with the same situation. My point being that, uh, that do not make assumptions about what the politics are of these issues because that too changes as to where people are. Um, and I watch people who fervently believe that price controls were wicked vote for them. I watch Democrats who fervently believe you shouldn't uh, engage in certain kinds of production vote for it. Uh, and, uh, and people doing things that uh, you know, they swore they would never do. Let me say that a third characteristic uh, is about the goals of policy making, and this is almost universal. There are a wide variety of goals of various factions and various theorists and various advocates about what you want out of energy policy. And there simply has never been uniform agreement at any time of any debate over what you're trying to accomplish. 
and they're very quickly, I won't even, I'm just going to them. Some are looking at what is the economic consequences, either for our region or for the, the supply you've got to have for the country. Some are looking at the environmental impacts and won't consider the other. Some are looking at the international security questions, like is this going to heighten uh, nuclear proliferation or is this going to, is the oil dependency going to put us in the hands of the wrong kind of people in the international uh, arena? And some are looking at equity questions, which is either the equities among income classes in the country or among regions in the country or among consumers and producers in the country. And there's one, however, enduring mantra, which Don mentioned, which was mentioned in the book and everything, and that is energy independence or oil independence. I'm not going to say much about it except to quickly challenge the idea that this ought to be the governing <coughs> principle of American policy. There are many useful things about diminishing our reliance uh, uh, on the, the world oil market. But the notion of independence is very ill-defined but it shows up so well in polling that almost no American politician in either party will not pay some uh, uh, respect uh, uh, toward the concept. But folks, we did not get independent in the 1970s and 80s, and I will say overwhelmingly the reason is because it was way too big a price to pay, and I'm not sure the price was willing. You either had to have tremendous regulation of the use of energy in this country, horrendous subsidization of alternatives uh, or, uh, and, and the be all and all that is you must drive the price of oil up. And guess what? When the public is screaming that the price of oil is too high, there is not a great propensity to say, I got an idea how we'll bring the prices down 10 years from now. I'm going to drive the prices up now. And any economist will tell you <laughs> if you don't do that, you're probably just playing with smoke and, and, and mirrors. Let me mention the fourth. Um, thing about uh, the characterizes uh, energy policy making, and that is very often regional differences in the country trump party differences. Mm -hmm. Now, it is very true that in the 90s <coughs> and in this last decade, our two parties became more coherent ideologically on the left and the right and were more different than they had been in terms of uh, their, uh, some of their advocacy on energy policy. But even there, uh, who produces and who consumes what uh, matters enormously. Uh, but uh, change uh, does occur um, uh, on these, and I want to mention a couple developments. I would suggest to you it's going to be interesting to see what happens on the, the PTC, the production tax credit next year, and some of these others as to whether or not ideology holds and we get rid of these subsidies that we don't need in the world or whether we uh, take them on. I'm, that's, that's not my comment on them. That's just uh, a point of view about them. Uh, because of what they mean to different regions and different states. And you will notice there are several of the new Republican governors who are engaged in major energy projects in their, their states as job creators, as being on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, and if you listen to the rhetoric, you wouldn't know whether it was a Democrat or Republican uh, speaking. Uh, that's not the same as some of the articulate you hear from some uh, of the party leaders uh, uh, in the Republican Party on the... the, uh, the, the uh, House and Senate, by the way, you hear the same thing on production <laughs> on the other side where some Democratic leaders won't touch the topic and, and out in the hinterland others are very much on it. But also, this is another place where change is underway. This new shale gas <laughs> is creating two huge changes in dynamics that we don't know what the consequences are going to be yet. One is all kinds of places are becoming producers that weren't, or what they produce is shifting, so that Pennsylvania will become less and less a coal production state and more and more a natural gas production state, and those members of uh, that delegation will find themselves torn <laughs> uh, on all kinds of policy choices <coughs> between gas and, and coal. And the same occurs on the consumption end, uh, where the utilities and the systems, I came from a part of the country, 98 percent dependent on coal production for its uh, on coal generation of electricity, um, that now that new natural gas supply at a cheaper river is driving out some of that coal, literally, literally today we have coal plants that are paid for cheap to run and they are not running because it's cheaper to operate uh, on the natural gas supply that's coming uh, uh, into their other uh, facilities in the utility system. So these are going to be changes that are going to be underway. Well, let me just quickly conclude. I'm sorry I've taken so much time here. Uh, that um, it's very hard often to figure out what's going on and what's real in Congress and what's important in Congress, partly because it's a complex institution. Uh, you always got the question, as I'm sure Bob did from our constituents, well, what does Congress think about this? 
And I would say, well, that's easy. Congress doesn't think. Um, <laughs> of course, they love that answer. Uh, it fit with what they believe. But in fact, Congress doesn't. It's a collective. Individuals in Congress think uh, kind of thing. It's hard to grasp. The, the second thing is, the rhetoric is often so distant from the reality that uh, uh, what you're doing or what you claim you're doing just don't match. And this is, seems to be a universal of American politics that I know if you ever go back and read, even the founding fathers had a tendency toward this. Um, the third is that a lot of battles are actually in American politics and in company are really symbolic. That is, be aware people that are engaged in the battle know that they're not coming to fruition whatsoever. They're engaged in an argument over values or articulation for interests back home or being doing what we call the cathartic function of letting, you know, I, I'd have people say, just go and give them hell, Phil, that's what I want you to do. Well, which hell they wanted me to give, it wasn't clear. But, uh, but the, the point is, lots of these things are not real and, know, and people in the know and following know they're not. And you can take a disparaging view of, you, of that if you want. I just see it as part of the political system and what matters is trying to sort out what's real. Let me suggest to you for your project and for others that are trying to observe in Congress, I think we have a serious work to do in political science these days to try to help work through a better theory of what, what is a reasonable set, set of expectations for the U.S. Congress and a reasonable expectations for what you ought to expect a member of Congress to do. Now, there are always going to be differences that were among my constituents over that. But I think one of the things we need to do is if we get a more sensible reason that we ought to expect Congress to be able to at least perform to a certain level, then we have a chance to hold more people accountable to it. On the other hand, it also is very unfair to assume, oh, well, this, this is, these ought to be the most rational people in the world. They don't have to deal with constituents. They don't have to deal with hard problems. They don't have to deal with past history. They don't have to deal with media. They don't have to deal with anything else. They can just sit around and be, uh, you know, uh, Plato-like and, and, and solve things. Well, you know, that's a bunch of baloney and everybody knows it. Uh, but the truth is a lot of what gets said about Congress and congressmen is simply so off the mark in terms of what you ought to t expect reasonable, intelligent people of integrity to do in a collective system. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David Conover. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me here today. And uh, I wanted to say that um, the title of this session here, Congress and the Global Energy Crunch, is, is that word global is critical because uh, you couldn't talk about a U.S. energy crunch, in my view. The, the um, statistic that uh, Don cited earlier about the U.S. being no closer to uh, greater energy independence, of course, was true when the book was written. But as we all know today, uh, we are significantly less dependent on foreign oils. Uh, domestic production has increased dramatically. And on the other side of the scale, we are much less um, energy intensive as an economy, about half as much as we were uh, before policies that Phil Sharp worked on and, and Bob Simon worked on uh, enabled us to become uh, significantly um, more energy efficient as an economy, um, both in our electricity sector, uh, almost completely off of oil, mm -hmm. except for a couple of random outlier <coughs> states who need to get off of oil, and uh, in the transportation sector, uh, which is um, still got work to do, but again, much more energy efficient than it was. And I think that's one of the reasons that it is um, so shocking to me that here we have been sitting around $100 oil for a year or so, when a decade ago we were between 12 and, and 20. I remember, I remember going to Utah and looking at an oil shale uh, demo, uh, which was really just a, a computer thing and some, and some whiteboards, and they were saying at $25 a barrel, this will be economic. Uh, of course, we blew by $25 a barrel in a blink of an eye, and yet we've been here at uh, between 80 and 100, and I would say no realistic prospect of going below $80 a barrel in the foreseeable future, and there's no real public outcry. Uh, the economy seems to have internalized uh, this <coughs> level of, of oil price. And while it is true that uh, nearly every major economic dislocation in the U.S., every recession, uh, was preceded by a spike in oil prices, if we're now going to be 
um, on a slow march north of Asia, <coughs> but a slow march, uh, then it appears that the system, both economic and political, has sort of accommodated that fact. Um, then, as Phil pointed out, um, we are awash in natural gas. Uh, he and I and a number of folks in the room here served on the National Petroleum Council examination of the natural gas supply issues at the request of Secretary Chu, and it's just astounding. Uh, when I served at the Department of Energy, uh, the idea was uh, to hurry up and link into the international gas market so that we could get imports of liquefied natural gas flowing into the United States because we were going to be in a supply crunch uh, and we needed to manage what at that point was this ridiculous volatility uh, when natural gas as recently as uh, in the months post Katrina in 2005 was at $15 a million BTU. And of course today uh, it's around two. And uh, in fact um, it, is, it is almost clearly an uneconomic investment for producers today. Uh, we probably need to figure out, and the market will no doubt figure out at some point whether we begin exporting or the use is dramatically increased, that a, that a range of six to eight dollars a million BTU it makes, makes production somewhat more sustainable. Um, but at the moment, uh, we are so blessed with natural gas that major manufacturing uh, entities are deciding once again to build in the United States, uh, that some of the coal plants that, that Phil talked about are burning natural gas without retrofitting the equipment. It's just so darn cheap. Um, so all of that leads to the conclusion from my perspective that the answer to the question of what is Congress going to do on energy is not lots, not much. Um, if we look at the period that, that Phil pointed out was an extremely robust legislative era, 2005 Energy Policy Act, 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act, 2009 Stimulus Bill with billions and billions of dollars flowing into the Department of Energy and into the Loan Guarantee Program, uh, neither of which was particularly well equipped to handle, as none of us would, a five, eight, tenfold increase in funding that had to be spent within two fiscal years, uh, and then Waxman-Markey. Uh, which at least passed the House and, and was likewise a major piece of energy legislation. Prior to that um, burst, uh, the last, what I, and, and Bob may have a different view on this, but the way I look at uh, energy bills, the last really sort of big impactful energy bill was in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened in <coughs> the 2000s that caused this, this um, demand? Well, a little bit of it was pent up, right? Um, but you clearly had uh, oil price volatility that was having negative impacts on the U.S. economy in the early 2000s. President Bush, in fact, in announcing <coughs> his uh, tax cuts that are um, so much and almost continuously in the news today, uh, talked about them as a tool to help Americans cope with high gasoline prices. Uh, I had frankly forgotten all about that. I thought it was just paying back the surplus, uh, but in fact that was one of the rationales. Uh, remember also, uh, in 2001, we were emerging from the California energy crisis, which was hugely uh, uh, impactful in, in that state. Uh, many would argue the result of, of poorly designed uh, deregulatory efforts and unwise decisions about um, where and from whom they would allow uh, suppliers to get uh, fuel for electricity, but nonetheless. Um, those two factors caused the Bush administration, of course, uh, to establish a national energy policy development team uh, headed by uh, Vice President Cheney. And uh, there was bipartisan interest then in uh, doing serious legislating on energy policy. On the right, uh, we were worried about lack of adequate transmission capacity. Um, there were people who called the U.S. a first-rate economy with a third-world transmission system. Uh, we were worried about energy insecurity, the hamstringing of our foreign policy on uh, oil issues. And we were worried about the impact that natural gas had had, the, the, the scarcity and volatility in natural gas on um, the manufacturing and other uh, sectors of the economy. Remember, we lost a fertilizer in industry because natural gas as a feedstock was, uh, was just too expensive. Uh, so there were those concerns on, on the right, as well as um, particularly with um, 
uh, Senator Bingaman's partner in those endeavors, uh, Senator Domenici's desire to help foster a nuclear renaissance. Uh, no new nuclear power had been built uh, in decades, and there was an idea that we needed to, to use our public policy, given the problems with natural gas, given the concerns about uh, the global commons, climate change, and, uh, and uh, conventional pollutants on coal, uh, the expense of renewables and the questionable scale-up capacity of a lot of renewables, Senator Domenici and a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats thought that nuclear power was really needed to be the answer. And so on the right, that was sort of pressure. Let's get, let's get a bill out that, that deals with that. On the progressive side, on the Democratic side, there was, of course, the strong concern about climate. Uh, there was a view that there had been a number of very successful uh, renewable portfolio standards passed at the state level and <coughs> wouldn't make sense uh, to enact something like that at the federal level. And, of course, the fuel economy standards hadn't been updated in uh, 20 years or so. And we were rapidly falling behind all of our major competitors and many developing nations in terms of fuel economy. And so there was this really uh, perfect storm of, of incentives to pass a bill. Uh, so in 2005, extremely, I mean, the, and Bob and his colleagues worked on it from 01, 02, 03, 04. Uh, finally, in, o, in 05, uh, a bill was enacted into law, signed by President Bush in August, uh, that established a loan guarantee program for uh, uh, unconventional new clean energy technologies, established uh, national transmission uh, corridors of importance, uh, a renewable fuels standard, uh, cleaned up the oxygenate requirement and got rid of MTBE, which was causing all sorts of <coughs> problems, particularly in the New England area that I happen to work for uh, members from, um, established uh, a series of authorized R&D programs at DOE, helped President Bush launch something that we don't talk about anymore, the hydrogen economy. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and yet, and yet, didn't do fuel economy standards didn't do climate change, really, other than some of these incentive programs for, for, for clean tech. Um, and so by the time the Democrats took over again, uh, those items had, had, had been left uh, unfinished, and so we had the Energy Independence and Security Act, and you had the first uh, fuel economy standards, in addition to actual reform of the CAFE program itself, addressing some of the concerns that uh, critics uh, <coughs> from states with lots of truck drivers uh, used to raise about the CAFE system. Um, you had the first fuel economy standards uh, in generation, uh, and yet fell short on an issue very important to Senator Bingaman, a renewable portfolio standard, and also on any kind of uh, robust cap-and-trade climate change-oriented uh, provision. Then the stimulus came along, and uh, unfortunately for Senator or for, uh, rather, uh, Waxman and Markey, with the stimulus program is it took all the dessert <laughs> and pre-passed that. So what they were left with was <coughs> just the hard policy. And uh, when, um, when uh, Chairman Waxman took out uh, John Dingell and became chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and uh, they worked up a very strong um, renewable portfolio standard and the, the cap-and-trade provision that, of course, uh, squeaked through the House and then died in the Senate. And that's where we are today. Um, when you look at the landscape of energy policy in a time of decreased energy insecurity, or put another way, enhanced energy security due to the domestic production and the tight oil in uh, North Dakota and other places that uh, Chairman Sharp mentioned, um, the ocean of natural gas upon which we sit that seems to have um, dealt a, um, a, a strong hand to uh, consumers of electricity, much less attention on climate change, even though it deserves a lot of attention, it's not getting any. Um, we were, a number of us were working on that, on that issue out in the um, advocacy community in the 2008-2009, and darn it, just when we had perfected our arguments about the <laughs> ability of the financial sector to manage a complex cap-and-trade system in CO2 and other greenhouse gases, along comes the subprime 
meltdown and everybody decided that the Wall Street couldn't manage, uh, you know, uh, uh, making change for a cup of coffee, much less uh, <coughs> dealing with a new carbon market that, is, that would touch every American in every facet of their lives. So that's um, been thrown under the bus. Um, and y it's hard to find really where the pressure would come uh, for another round of serious legislating on, on energy. Now, Phil mentioned one area, and that is the expiration of the production tax credits that uh, support the renewable uh, power sector to some degree. And you saw Congress uh, easily let lapse the ethanol tax credit. Now, that's wasn't such a big deal because, of course, ethanol has the renewable fuel standard that was established in 2005, so they actually had a double mandate. They had a tax credit and a, and a blender mandate and a tariff on Brazilian ethanol. Um, but nonetheless, that went away. Um, but renewable power is really taking a beating with these low gas prices. So you see more and more members on both sides of the aisle uh, really talking about we need to figure out a way to extend these um, expiring tax credits and, and let's leave the big debate over tax reform uh, for another day. Um, the second area is on uh, innovation. Um, there seems to be strong bipartisan support. Um, Lamar Alexander and other Republicans and, and then of course a number of Democrats uh, for um, not only supporting um, the ARPA-E that was enacted as part of another bill that uh, Senator Bingaman and Senator Domenici worked on, the America Competes Act in 2007, which, uh, which is designed sort of as strategic R&D around energy challenges and by all accounts uh, has been quite successful, modeled after the DARPA program at the Defense Department, uh, but also more traditional R&D programs um, at the Department of uh, Energy. And so, um, There'll be battles probably in the appropriations committees or in the CR or an omnibus um, on uh, energy innovation spending. And then uh, finally, there has been expressed at least ongoing uh, interest in efficiency and electrification. And of course, uh, Senators Shaheen and Portman have an efficiency bill. Uh, Senator Alexander in the past has worked on an electrification bill, vehicle electrification bill. Uh, so all of those areas um, where you might not get one big bill through the Energy Committee, in fact you won't because of the <coughs> really stupid idea that some of the new Republicans came up with, and I should say as, as a Republican in all love and respect, uh, to, the, uh, that, to the effect that you can't pass anything out of the committee unless it's fully offset, which makes zero sense, but does effectively hamstring the committee. Uh, so there won't be a big bill, uh, but there may be work on these various activities. And then the final piece, which is to me the real wild card, is all of this happy talk about our energy system only works if the shale gas play really does uh, continue. And there are a couple things that can screw up the shale gas play. Sustained low prices, frankly, is, is, is a little problematic, uh, but the market ultimately will take care of that. Uh, state-based bans and prohibitive regulation could screw that up, and you may well see that. I grew up in Ohio and, and uh, have family in Pennsylvania, and you drive through some of these shale places and you see ban the frack all over, signs in people's front yards all over. Explain and, that, what that is. Uh, so them. hydraulic fracturing, of course, is the production technique that along with horizontal drilling has enabled us to unlock this <coughs> great um, quantity of shale gas and tide oil. Uh, involves uh, high pressure injection of uh, some chemicals, sand and water into the shale where the gas is trapped, thus fracturing it, hence the phrase hydraulic fracturing it, uh, and allowing uh, production uh, to occur. Um, you know, as someone who got to start as an environmental lawyer, there is a whole regulatory and legal regime that governs the injection of wastewater and product into the uh, subsurface. It's called the Underground Injection Control uh, Regime that was established as part of the Safe Drinking Water Act, but the 2005 Energy Policy Act preserved and expanded an exemption for oil and gas production activities such that EPA cannot apply that to the fracking. They apply it to the wastewater disposal at the end of the process. And in fact, the earthquake activity that people read about that occurred in um, Ohio and elsewhere was actually a result of that 
wastewater disposal under the existing regulatory regime, not the production side of the equation, which is kind of interesting, but stands to reason because, of course, when you're on the production side, you want to use as little of the stuff as possible to, to achieve your goal. When you're on the waste disposal side, of course, your goal is to jam as much of the product into the waste site as you possibly can. And so that, that, that will be taken care of in due course. Um, but in any event, there's a lot of local opposition uh, to hydraulic fracturing. And part of the challenge, and it's interesting, you don't see that same opposition to the North Dakota tight oil production, which is the same technology. But the reason, I think, for that is that those communities are accustomed to energy production activities. The parts of Pennsylvania, it's been generations since coal production was active. It's been generations in Ohio since coal production has been active. Uh, the New York areas are actually the Finger Lakes, which is a vineyard, uh, wine, and tourism center. And so the, the idea of large-scale industrial processing going on there with truck traffic in and out and all that, no matter what it was, would be controversial. But in any event, that could screw things up. And then what else? Well, obviously, you know, I have to say as a Republican, misguided and, and prohibitive and punitive EPA regulation. So is there a deal to be had on regulation of fracking in the next Congress? Well, certainly not in this Congress. Um, but boy, wouldn't it be interesting uh, if we turned uh, <coughs> 40 years of environmental regulation on its head. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental federalism, for the, <coughs> as most of you know, means that the feds can set a floor below which the states can't go but the states can regulate as strictly above that floor as they choose. That's environmental federalism, a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. In this case, because of the national security, energy security, electricity reliability, and overall macroeconomic impact of natural gas production, I'd posit that we create a collar. I would be interested in an, in, in an intelligent debate about what is the minimum regulatory apparatus that's going to apply to hydraulic fracturing, and what is the maximum that a state or locality can extract <coughs> from the industry as it moves forward in that area. Um, that to me uh, would be a, uh, a debate worth having and would be um, something that, that uh, for the good of the country uh, could help us ensure the robust production of natural gas for a variety of uses including export uh, for decades to come. So thanks a lot. Thank you, David. <coughs> Bob Simon. Well, I'm reminded of a comment made by one of uh, Phil Sharp's illustrious colleagues, whom I never had the opportunity to meet, Mo Udall, who observed at one point, well, everything's been said, but not everybody has said it. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to, but I'm, I'm glad for um, the excellent um, exposition that um, um, Phil and Dave have given to a lot of these sort of energy issues. I'm going to sort of. Uh, briefly um, hits what I think are some of the highlights of what they've said and sort of reframe them in my, as I would, um, and then talk about one or two other things and then we'll turn it over to Jennifer so people can actually ask us some questions before the hour <laughs> six o'clock arrives. Um, let me start off with I think um, uh, what I see as kind of what is a, a, the look ahead for energy policy. You know, what, what's, what's going on sort of at the largest, most macro level, and Phil touched on a number of these things. Um, <clears throat> the first point I would make is that our global energy future really is not going to be written in the United States or in Canada or in the European Union, not in the OECD. Our global energy future is getting written in the non-OECD countries. Uh, these are the countries that have very low per capita energy consumption. Uh, their great desire is to have a per capita energy consumption more like ours. So they aspire to the same levels of energy prosperity, if you want to call it that way, that we have in the developed world. I think Phil alluded to that. Um, the second point I would make is that our current suite of fuels and technologies uh, cannot possibly get us there on a global basis. We just don't have the technologies and the fuels today to allow that level of energy prosperity to be reached around the world at any sort of reasonable price. Point number three, then, is, well, that being the case, you need a transformation. You need transformative changes to occur. Um, and th those transformative changes will happen because I don't think that we're going to tell the non-OECD countries to please take a check and wait a while. Um, they're not going to. And that will radically, those transformative changes will radically change global energy markets. They will create new energy markets. They will create new patterns of investment. 
Uh, they will create uh, demands for new kinds of technologies. So these transformative changes, whether we like it or not, are going to happen somewhere. And then the fourth point is, okay, that being the case, where would we like that transformation to happen first? And who would we like to lead that transformation? And the question is, really, do we really want the United States to lead that transformation, or do we want somebody else to lead it, um, recognizing that to the extent that you create transformative new technologies and commercialize them, to the extent that you pioneer new kinds of markets and um, lead them, you know, the, the first movers tend to acquire a lot of economic ben benefit from being first. And so do we want those first mover advantages, or do we want to lose out on those markets of the future to others? So, th so at sort of at the largest, most macro level of, of energy policy, you know, those are the, the larger forces that really are shaping the energy world of the future. And of course, the United States, we're used to sort of thinking about ourselves, as, as we should, as sort of the leading nation in the world. And so we sometimes get a little myop myopic in our points of view. And, you know, I think we need to start off by thinking about some of these larger transformative changes. Now, um, we face in Congress a number of challenges um, in addressing these kinds of changes. Some of them are challenges that are sort of specific to energy policy, and some of these are challenges that you know we run into again and again and again just on any issue area in Congress. So let me talk about the ones that we run into all the time in Congress. And, and a, a good way of sort of summarizing those challenges is to take a little sort of statistical view of how the 112th Congress is doing these days. Okay, and I, I do keep a, a running box score of, of public laws passed by this Congress and other Congresses. So as of today, May 21st, we have enacted 119 public laws in the 112th Congress, 119. So you say, well, 119 is a respectable three-digit number, so maybe that's pretty good. Well, how does it compare? Well, two years ago in the last Congress, when May 21st of the second session rolled around, we had enacted 166 public laws, about 40 percent more productivity in the last Congress than this. Two years before that, on the 110th Congress, we had enacted not 119 and not 166. We had elect, el enacted 233 public laws at this juncture. That's almost double sort of current productivity. And of course, at this point, May 21st of the second session, in the 80th Congress, we had enacted 547 public laws, not 119. And you may wonder why I jumped from the 110th to the 80th Congress. Well, you know about the 80th Congress, you just don't know it by the number. This is the Congress that Harry Truman immortalized as the do-nothing Congress. <laughs> so, so it's one way to sort of think about what's going on today in Washington is to realize that we're currently at 21.8 percent of the legislative efficiency of the do-nothing Congress. Now, of course, you know, as scholars of Congress, you know, I'm here in, the, uh, in a center to study Congress, and so I, I have to be the first to admit before someone jumps down my throat that, well, lots have changed. A lot has changed since 1948, and Congress and, you know, enacts laws in entirely different ways. But, but still, I think that even if you look in the last three Congresses, you can see a real decline in the legislative productivity of Congress. And, and the reason for that is pretty well understood, because productivity is down because polarization is up. You know, and National Journal and others have, have you know, graphically illustrated this ph phenomenon that where once upon a time there was a lot of ideological overlap and sort of the most conservative Democrat was way to the right of the most liberal Republican. So there was a lot of, lot of uh, ideological overlap between the parties. You know, progressively over the last, you know, several years, the, the, you know, they have, um, the people in the middle who are the overlap have kind of disappeared, right? They've retired or they've been defeated. Um, we can all think of current examples. Now, Olympia Snow's retired. My boss is my boss is retiring. Uh, Senator Luger's not coming back, and and so we see this polarization and this loss of people in the middle, who previously played a very important role in trying to communicate and broker, um, you know, compromise or um, you know non nonpolar thinking in Congress um, about major issues, and so you know we see that that's a that's a major problem that we have in the Congress as a whole, and it doesn't affect just energy, it affects just about every issue, as you can see. It's, it's, no, it's not a big you know, surprise that we haven't enacted a substantial energy bill in this Congress, but we haven't enacted substantial bills on lots of topics in this Congress, and this is sort of the phenomenon that we're dealing with. Now, with respect to sort of energy in particular, we have another set of challenges in Congress, and again, I think 
um, you know, Dave and, and Phil have done a pretty good job of, of talking about them. I'll just sort of summarize them sort of briefly, okay? Uh, problem number one is mythological thinking about energy policy, okay? And, and so, you know, this is the, this is Phil pointed to it. This is when, when you know, every, every sort of you know, new politician comes to town at some point seems to give a speech that says, well, we don't, we need to have an energy policy in this country. You know, we don't have an energy policy. And of course, as Phil said, that's it's nonsense. Of course we have an energy policy. We've already had an energy policy. I've, I, you know, it's, it's my professional duty to, to, to get these things and put them on the bookshelf in my, in my office. And my, my, my bookcase is overstuffed with, you know, energy policies. And some, actually, some administrations have done a pretty good job of, of coming up with very nice, concise, comprehensive formulations of energy policy. And they're very well, well worth reading. Um, th another part of the myth mythological thinking is that we take issues, not just energy, but lots of issues, but energy is one, that are very large and complex, and we just have this myth that what we're looking at is a single point failure. There's one thing that's wrong, and by God, if we just fix that one thing, click, everything would, would be perfect and hunky-dory. That's not true of any major policy area. It's not true of health care, not true of tax, a tax policy, certainly is not true of energy policy. We're not looking at a single point failure. The, the problems that we and challenges that we face in energy are much more complicated than that. Uh, Phil and, and, and uh, Dave, um, you know, referred to this um, sort of episodic nature, the sort of the episodes that, that dominate energy policy. And I would just add one thing to sort of Phil's discussion of the episodes is, is the ironic thing is that when we're in the middle of an episode, you can't get anything done. If you sort of think about, you know, was, where was the energy, Comprehensive Energy Policy <laughs> Act of 2008 when oil was uh, at 147 bucks a barrel and gasoline was over four bucks a, uh, a gallon? You can't find it. Where was the comprehensive energy policy of 1990 when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait? And suddenly I was outraged. I was down at the shore and you know, I drove to the gas station. My God, it's up to $1.36 a gallon. I mean, holy crap, that country can't sustain that. But anyway, it was a big jump at the time. But you know, there was no energy policy bill at that time. Usually what happens when you're in the middle of one of these episodes, what you discover is that people actually want to kind of have the argument as opposed to the accomplishment. They would like to uh, sort of, you know, use whatever the episode that they're in the middle of to sort of validate what they've alwe always have thought and, and more importantly what they've always have said. Um, and, and to use it sort of as a debating point. And it's almost in a sort of perverse way, you sort of get the feeling sometimes that they actually would prefer to kind of you know, keep, keep the argument on for a while and, and let the episode go. Um, and so what you generally find is that um, energy policy accomplishment and energy legislative accomplishment usually sort of comes two, two years after an episode, okay? Usually it's the episode has subsided, all the people who were sort of making rhetorical hay out of it have sort of moved on to something else. People remember that there was a problem uh, but, but now there's sort of more space for people to actually dialogue and work on the solution to the problem without being accused of selling out their side to the other side when we're in the middle of this great um, debate that, you know, with proves that we're right and they're wrong. So, so the, the episodes, you know, do tend to drive, um, but, but not immediately. They tend to actually, when you're in the middle of them, to actually make it a lot harder to get things done. And I think that we're sort of seeing uh, seeing a little bit of that this year too, which sort of brings me to the next challenge is that lots of times energy policy is really used for symbolic and rhetorical purposes, right? People, you know, it's kind of like, don't confuse me with facts. You know, I've got my little laminated card that has my points on this thing. And, you know, I really, really don't want you to sort of tell me, you know, that, um, you know, energy production, oil and gas production is up in the United States this year because we all know that it's down, you know, that Obama has, you know, cratered oil and gas production in the country. And, you know, I'll, I'll work the statistics around to prove that. And, but when you actually look at the statistics, you, you sort of get, and we've had hearings and we get Cambridge Energy Research Associates and other people who are really very sort of nonpartisan, um, um, you know, experts on it, they talk about the great revival of America oil and gas. And, and, and then people say, well, okay, well, well, that's all in private land. It can't be any federal production. No, no. You actually look at onshore federal production. Yeah, that's up to. Well, what about offshore production? Well, we did have Deepwater Horizon, and so if you st strictly look at 2010 to 2011, yes, it's down. If you look at 2012, it's back up. All three of those years are higher than any year previous um, for the next for the previous decade. So you know, people you know have this great desire to to sort of you know stick to their rhetoric and stick to their symbolic issues, and to the extent possible, try to sort of you know you know jury fit. Uh, jury rig the facts around them. And so that's another challenge that we face is actually getting people to look at the fact that in fact our energy, our import dependence is down. 
It peaked in 2005. That was seven years ago, right? It was at 60% then. You, th you hear lots of people give ta talks that are talking about how we're still 60% dependent on foreign oil. That hasn't been true for seven years. You know, we're down below 50%. Uh, if we do nothing but stay on the current trend, we'll be down into the 30s, 30% uh, range, or upper 30s, um, by 2035. That's from the Energy Information Administration. And there's actually reasons to believe that, you know, we'll do even better than that if we sort of keep doing sort of sensible policy things in the interim. And, you know, it's not hard to figure out why, why did we go from 60% to under 50% headed down to below 40%? Well, we actually did do a couple useful things on a bipartisan basis. You know, we, we actually increased CAFE standards for the first time in 30 years. That was a bipartisan achievement. You know, that was a lot of people on the Republican and Democratic side um, in Congress worked on that. They were assisted by a Republican president who thought that we shouldn't be addicted to oil and was um, actually uh, you know, supportive of, of um, reforming CAFE standards, sort of changing around the way that you calculated them based on the footprint of the vehicle and was willing to sort of sign a bill with those. So that was a genuine bipartisan accomplishment that made a huge difference in sort of our import dependence. Another thing that made a huge, has made a huge is sort of the advent of biofuels. You know, you go out to the gas pump, it says up to 10% of the thing you're pumping is ethanol. Yeah, 10% of our liquid transportation fuel stream is not derived from oil, it's derived from ethanol now. People are talking about taking it up to 15%. That has had a big impact on the oil and gas industry and has a big impact on prices. And so we have found other substitutes and we're looking for ways to substitute electricity and other things for, you know, petroleum-based um, inputs to, to the point that actually, you know, many parts of the United States are sort of seen as kind of stagnant um, by the oil and gas industry, by the refining industry. We're seen as sort of the, they talk about the Atlantic Basin, you know, the United States and the European Union as being kind of stagnant demand growth. You know, the real, the real demand growth is in Asia. That's where they want to build all the new refineries, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to quote unquote rationalize the refineries um, in, in the, uh, so surrounding the Atlantic Basin. So, so again, the symbolic rhetorical uses of energy versus um, you know, versus what's actually going on is a big challenge to getting something done. And finally, as Phil pointed out, a lot of this stuff, you know, once you get past the, the, the sort of the very top bullet point, right, which people at the rhetorical or symbolic level, you know, want to craft a message, once you get down into the actual content of energy policy, you discover it gets re real regional real quick. And, and that's a challenge, but that's also a benefit because the fact that energy policy can be so regional makes it um, possible for, for you to discover bipartisan agreement because people from one region of a country, uh, whether they're Republican or Democrat, if they're from oil and gas state, like you know, Senator Bingman's from a, a state with a lot of small oil and gas producers, well, we care about them. And, you know, Senator Inhofe is you know, a good Republican from Oklahoma. I don't know that he and Senator Bingman agree on a lot of things, but you know, he's got a lot of small oil and gas producers in Oklahoma too, right? So, I mean, I think you can have, um, in that regionality, you can have, you know, the, the starting point for a real honest bipartisan engagement. And the trick of getting comprehensive bills through the Congress really is to try to discover these you know, ways of putting together interregional coalitions uh, that get you to the sort of the requisite number of votes of getting things through. Now, uh, the last thing I'll say about sort of how all this affects Congress is, you know, we, in Congress, we like to sort of think about ourselves and, and only ourselves, but I have to admit that one of the things that makes a difference um, in our ability to get energy legislation done, I think we have seen this over the years, actually is presidential leadership. To the extent that presidents nominate energy as an important um, um, problem and uh, work on it, um, you know, things happen. You know, and, and, you know, Oppenheimer talks about, you know, I agree with Phil that, that he sort of missed a lot of important stuff that was happening in between 73 and 78. But, you know, he talked about some important things that happened in 78. And sure enough, Jimmy Carter had something to do with that. You know, he nominated energy as an important national topic, kept talking about it, and that enabled Congress to address it. You know, same thing with George Herbert Walker Bush um, back in um, 1990, 19, in, the 19, in 1990, before uh, the, uh, the invasion of, of Kuwait, he had, you know, Admiral Watkins and Linda Stunts and the people at the Department of Energy courting a national energy strategy. That's one of the many sort of documents uh, of energy policies. It's still worth reading today. Um, but the fact that they had a, a national energy strategy written out was very um, instrumental in allowing Congress to formulate the Energy Policy Act of 92. 
similarly, where presidents kind of sort of, you know, don't, uh, you know, focus on other things. I mean, there was not a big push uh, or identified push during the Reagan era on energy. They were looking to sort of, you know, um, dial down a lot of, of the things that Carter was uh, putting money into. You didn't see a lot of energy policy legislation. Uh, uh, George W. Bush, I think, once he started about you know, breaking our addiction to foreign oil and, again, nominating that topic, uh, we saw a lot of interest in it. And, of course, President Obama talks about energy a lot. And, you know, they, it, you know I think they put all their, um, they put a lot of effort uh, and uh, a lot of chits on the table uh, with respect to trying to get a climate bill through. Uh, I think the unfortunate consequence of that was that we weren't able to get um, an energy bill through because the two topics were too closely uh, overlapping with each other. And I think a lot of people wanted to kind of go for the, the, the larger accomplishment as opposed for the more modest accomplishment. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, to the extent that we're able to get energy po legislation through, one of the things that will help is the fact that, you know, both sides keep talking about it, and, but the president has the biggest bully pulpit in town. And so when the president's talking about it, that helps Congress, you know, focus on the topic. So those are some of my thoughts about kind of, you know, where we're going, where we need to go, some of the challenges that we face, and sort of what makes a difference to us in Congress. Thank you. <coughs> Jennifer. Well, I'll try to be brief because I'm sure people would like to get to the questions. Um, when Don sent me an email and asked me to be on this panel, I said, um, why? <laughs> because um, I'm not an energy expert. Uh, I spend almost no time thinking about energy policy as per se. I spend most of my time looking at uh, energy issues as they impact other aspects of Congress, both legislatively and in electoral politics. Um, the, I was trying to think back to the first example that I saw of this, and I think probably most the, the most significant one was during was n the end of the last session when Republicans and Democrats were fighting over the payroll tax, um, ho extension of a payroll tax holiday, and um, the House wanted to include in that bill um, provision that would expedite the Keystone pipeline. I'm actually intrigued and surprised that no one mentioned Keystone in all of the of discussion of this because it tends to be the one um, energy issue that, that we spend most of our time thinking of as reporters, as Hill reporters. Um, that obviously did not come to pass, and that bill did not work out the way the House had hoped. Um, but then it's uh, resurfaced again in the, the attempt to get a highway bill, and in two ways. One, in the, f the fact that when the House went to do their uh, transportation bill, one of the first things they were grappling with was through uh, some of these issues that you've talked about, energy efficiency, the reduction in the Highway Trust Fund and how to compensate for that. And the way that the House proposed to compensate for that was to um, increase production uh, drilling and, and, and reopen the discussion of Anwar, which was an anthem even to some Republicans from more moderate districts. Um, it became a, a huge mess, actually. It wasn't able to even be voted on in, in that chamber. Uh, the Senate went on to pass their own bipartisan uh, transportation bill, and now they're in a conference committee. And again, one of the, the huge uh, sticking points is whether they're going to include a provision for the Keystone to expedite in the Keystone pipeline. Uh, and the other piece of this uh, that we see um, in terms of offsetting costs for different types of legislations or pay-fors is that Democrats in the Senate have been very keen on attempting to reduce uh, so-called uh, loopholes for oil and gas companies or big oil to uh, offset the cost of certain pieces of legislation when Republicans in the House would seek another method for doing that. So my, m my the prism that I see these energy issues for tends to be almost strictly political. Um, and um, while I was very interested to read an Oppenheimer to hear today about the the regional bifurcations, or not, perhaps multiple ways of looking at this through a regional prism is a rather partisan one. Perhaps n in this Congress that may be less true. Um, and I think about this when I think about approaching the Farm Bill, which is the next big piece of legislation that we're looking at. The Farm Bill is another bill that's often, as you know, Congressman Ben, is something that's been uh, where the regional interests more than partisan interests have been represented. I'm not sure that's going to totally be true in this Congress, and I think that's um, also true as m with respect to energy, uh, I certainly don't hear anybody talking about big energy legislation, uh, certainly not in this Congress uh, when everyone's looking toward the next election. Um, and the other piece of it, obviously, that you I look at is in, in, in the, hundred, um, in the uh, 2012 campaign. Um, one of the most interesting uh, little micro examples we saw of that was in the West Virginia primary where President Obama was almost beat uh, by a felon 
from Texas in the Democratic primary there, which um, there were a, a lot of people speculating as to why that was, but one of the, the most convincing case I heard actually was a perception in that region that the President's policies did not favor coal. Um, coal, I think, just like you had soccer moms, I think you'll see, you know, coal daddies or something in this election. I wouldn't be surprised if that really uh, surfaces. Um, furthermore, uh, we talked about uh, cap the cap and trade bill. You know, there's here's something unlike the health care legislation that actually never passed the Congress, and yet you will see uh, in political ads um, attacks on members who have voted for cap and trade, e even though it, it never passed, just because. Um, that is such a, uh, a, a toxic issue in some, in some districts, or at least as, as it's portrayed. And again, um, the, the pay-fors, the closing of, of tax loopholes for ga oil and gas are something that uh, came up in the super committee. It, that was one of the things that was definitely on the table there, and I think you'll continue to hear more about that. Now, as, as I've just made this argument that the 112th Congress is much more um, bifurcated by, by party and not regionalizing these issues, um, you do see some uh, definite contradictions in that. For one thing, I think it's really interesting that President Obama has more or less co-opted the 2008 Republican um, slogan, uh, the all above energy policy, which it's really, if you flash back to 2008, and I picture Sarah Palin debating um, uh, this, it's almost amazing to think that uh, that President Obama goes to Oklahoma and talks about all of the above, but he does it, and he does it a lot. At the same time, um, you saw, as I mentioned during the transportation bill, a lot of Republicans who were resistant to certain types of, of drilling proposals, certainly as a pay for, for um, the highway bill. Um, and you do see a lot of intersection, um, particularly with Keystone. There are many Democrats who support Keystone. Um, and uh, I think, I was trying to think of, of Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas, who's one of the most uh, progressive members of the Democratic uh, caucus, and I was thinking about um, Michelle Bachman, who is probably her polar opposite on every single issue, but they both support the Keystone Pipeline. So I think that's, those are very interesting. And then you have someone like Mary Landro, who's a pretty, uh, I guess a moderate Democrat, but ex extremely against any ending of oil subsidies, obviously from Louisiana, and would vote against, I think, any bill supported by her conference that had that. So uh, regionalism does still play perhaps more than in other areas, but it would seem to me that the um, polarized nature of this particular Congress is probably more significant when it comes to energy, and it's particularly because the House in, in particular, and Republicans in Congress, are so hostile to this administration, they'd be perhaps less likely to work with them even um, in areas where they have philosophical or economic intersections. Um, I think that was about all the observations that I've made in the in these particular uh, in this in this particular part. Except oh, I will also would just note um, on that that Tom Coburn, for example, another very re conservative Republican, um, was very much behind the closing of those ethanol subsidies and also would support that for oil and gas. So uh, I the concept that's driving much of this Congress, particularly the Republican cold House, is um, about cutting costs and paying for all programs with some other type of, of cost cutting. And I do think th that will continue to be their theme and would trump perhaps any other um, vision for a global energy policy, even one that's well constructed in those committees uh, that, that, uh, that reflects Republican values. Thank you. <coughs> Before I open the floor uh, to questions, I just want to follow up on one thing and allow the other panelists uh, as well as Bob to, to comment on. And Bob, you said something very interesting about future transformative changes being shaped not by the developed countries, the OECD countries, but by the developing countries. I was wondering whether you might expand a bit on how you see that happening and what the interaction will be with the developed countries. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you can sort of, you know, rip things from the headlines. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we've seen just in the last week is, um, you know, a trade case being brought against the Chinese for um, dumping um, solar panels, um, cheap solar panels in the United States, right? And uh, one of the things that uh, that um, betokens is that, you know, the, the Chinese have made, you know, very strong um, investments in sort of the manufacturing capability um, for solar panels. Um, you know, um, you know, the Chinese system is is uh, is very different from ours. Their ability to put 
um, significant amounts of state money, whether it's from their national government or from provincial governments or even local governments, um, into energy enterprises is, um, defies what we're able to do in this country. But as a result, they have a tremendous uh, amount of manufacturing capability for solar panels. And, you know, to the extent that, um, <clears throat> you know, you sort of, uh, part of that reason is there is because they do have um, an increasingly large um, home market for it. So you, if you have a, a market for advanced technology, you eventually will draw manufacturing to where you market. And then one of the other things that we have sort of seen um, happen is, you know, Applied Materials, which is, you know, a major, um, you know, technology company that, that, that builds the machines that makes the solar, that makes the solar wafers. Uh, applied Materials decided to put a $2 billion R&D facility in China. So, the, so as the market drew the manufacturing, the manufacturing started drawing, drawing R&D. So these are, these are transformative changes that are happening outside this country, and they're going to make a difference. And uh, it's, you know, as Phil's um, uh, pointed out, sort of hard to, to sit here and completely get our arms around a prognostication of where it's going to go because the world is full of, of um, interesting and unexpected surprises. And so the course of the Chinese economy going forward will obviously make a difference to their ability to keep playing that role in, in sort of subsidizing a manufacturing base for these advanced energy technologies. But, um, you know, that's a reality that's out there, and that's something we need to pay attention to. Dr. Sharp? Uh, well, one is I uh, was taken by what Bob said about uh, <clears throat> if you lead on the technology, there are certain benefits that come to you, and I mm -hmm. tend to subscribe to that. And coming from the heartland of America, I, in my heart, I want it to happen here. But it, it can be a double-edged sword, too. And the truth is that the ability to radically bring down the general cost of solar mm -hmm. <laughs> would be a high cost proposition for our government to subsidize and will be much more effectively done by <laughs> the Chinese, partly through subsidy, but partly through creating a massive market uh, for it. Now, other things are happening in Germany and Spain on uh, solar where they, they are subsidizing too. But my point is, we everything's not a negative loss for us. Some of it is quite a benefit if the if the technology gets demonstrated. Because if you want to do something about climate, solar has to beat on an economic basis, not just regulate the hell out of everything uh, to able to get it. I don't know, just talking about solar. Have to, you know, there's a whole range of things that have to happen. And one of the most interesting things that's happening in China right now is you take Southern Company, which is building the first new nuclear power plant in the United States uh, since uh, the last license, I think, was issued in 1975. The building went on for mm -hmm. 15 or 20 more years. But... Um, then they have the, the first the new license to build that. They have been uh, on the site of at least one, maybe the two uh, AP1000 uh, Westinghouse uh, 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 plants that are under construction in China because they want to see and learn from that construction uh, technique. Uh, and, uh, and Duke Energy is doing the same thing, where they have agreements, which they're in, in theory it's mutually beneficial to both uh, parties in this case, but where Jim Rogers actually talks about how it's so difficult here to launch, given the regulatory environment and the economic environment, to launch big uh, energy projects is where you can use them as a laboratory. Does this work or doesn't this not work uh, kind of proposition? And we will benefit from that. So it's, it's very hard to sort out uh, when you're speaking nationally about where the gains and the losses are. And by the way, the Chinese have got plenty of economic problems to have to thrash through uh, to make it successful for them to attract and keep uh, both the capital and the, uh, the things that go on. So I'm, I'm of two minds on that issue, but there is no question about what Bob says. It's, there has been a significant shift uh, and in energy because, of course, the Chinese government is painfully aware that to keep their, sustain their economic development, they have got to, uh, and they had to finally violate uh, an age-old proposition, which was they had to be domestically yeah. energy independent, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they are uh, huge and massive importers of oil now and, and uh, other things as well. So that change is underway, uh, and what we have to find is what is our niche in this world in terms of it's not just uh, the technology development, but, but even on the R&D side, uh, to which case are we going to be the leaders on the research and development 
uh, in our academic and our laboratories and whatnot, or to which degree are those going to really need to be cooperatively done uh, and whatnot. I still think we have a huge advantage in that sector, uh, but that will also be challenged, as you've indicated. <coughs> David, do you have something to add? So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Bob that, that those are big picture 30,000, 50,000 foot drivers of policy, but when you look at um, what you're really talking about trying to do and transform into a, an abundant clean energy economy, there's only really two ways to do that. Um, one is you make dirty energy more expensive, and the other is you make clean energy cheaper. And dirty energy more expensive with things like carbon taxes, regulatory activity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Republicans, conservatives been opposed to that for um, time immemorial. Making clean energy cheaper through subsidies and other programs, you saw pretty much the high water mark of that in a bipartisan fashion in 2005, when much of the 2005 Energy Policy Act was trying to do precisely that. Um, then in the stimulus bill, which took that on steroids, you saw completely partisan. And the reason for that is that there was a real sea change in the Republican Party between those two events. And whereas before you could pretty much count on Republicans kind of being pro-chamber of commerce, pro-business, yeah, you know, I can fiddle around with the tax code to help my, my buddy down at the Kiwanis Club, the new breed of Republicans just want to make, and we were talking about this before, make federal government smaller. And what worries me about all of that is we've had a long history of bipartisanship on innovation, on energy innovation. And you have, you're, we're holding on to a core of that at the front end of the process. But when you get down to tax credits, subsidizing commercialization activities, there are a lot of Republicans that really don't care if the first mover on that is China. And in fact, you know, you can make a reasonably good economic case building on what Phil said, that it's better to be second. That the first mover is the one that incurs all the costs, that has all the problems, and then th everybody who builds on their success reaps all the benefits. So while I agree with Bob that that is the transformation that really must occur, and it has to occur on a global basis, what I worry about is the disconnect between that sort of reality uh, and then the sort of facts on the ground in Congress and particularly in the Republican Party today. I would say that, uh, you know, being, uh, it, it's like Avis, so we try harder, and being numbers, n number two, that's a, would you date yourself if you're, if you know that advertising <laughs> slogan, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, there, there is a tremendous advantage to being a first mover because um, you know, there's only so much intellectual property to go around. I mean, I think that, you know, people who, 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 try, who are, you know, trying to catch up, uh, you discover in a globalized world in which intellectual property is protected, that they have to, you know, you know, difficult navigate with great difficulty around people's existing patents and intellectual property um, and trade secrets and 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 source and just know how um, and how to do these things. That really allows people to, even if you even if you sort of see, you know see what the first mover is doing, and you sort of try to replicate, you know, okay, I know that they have this machine and that machine and that machine and that machine. What you don't know is their you know, applied experience in sort of um, systems integration and how they made those different things actually come together so that they're getting, you know, 15 widgets a minute instead of five widgets a minute. And uh, so I do think that there are real advantages to being, um, being there first and, um, you know, not, not least of which is that you do tend to um, become the magnet for research, further research and development. So it's, it's an important position to try to, to try to gain and keep. And not all countries have the same respect for intellectual property rights. I remember being in Guangzhou province and being shown a software factory where they were bragging their founder was the, the uh, Chinese Bill Gates, and sure enough, they were using Microsoft programs to convert to, for their own purposes there, but in any event. Let's open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Please uh, wait for a microphone and give your name and affiliation. Show of hands. Who's going to be the first? Over here. Fatima. Hello, Lisa Papani with the law firm of Van Ness Feldman. In terms of an oil and gas question, I wanted to get some reactions from the panel of ideas that have been thrown out from bills that suggest if there is a SPRO release, there should be increased drilling on federal lands, or why not have a sliding scale based on prices for oil and gas subsidies? 
Well, the first thing I would say about the Spro question is that those are two, 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 two topics that have uh, no intellectual core in common, right? I mean, if, if you, you know, um, but first of all, we are increasing oil and gas production on federal lands. Um, I know that that, you know, there's, there's some resistance, to, you know, to those statistics, but I think if you take a careful look uh, at, at, you know, what the Energy Information Administration is putting out and, and sort of, you know, statistics from the Department of the Interior, th it really is sort of inescapable that we are, you know, production is up onshore every year. Uh, every year is higher than the one before it. Um, production is offshore. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But I'm just saying that, that, that you know, that, that, that that's a good thing in and of itself that's happening. You know, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you know, is, is, a, is a policy response to market disruptions, right? Uh, Short-term market disruptions, right? Um, you know, whether the market disruptions come from some kind of supply cutoff or from a hurricane or from, you know, some other factor or, or some other problem in the infrastructure. If the, all the pipelines suddenly went offline. You would, you might re want to release oil from the SPRO to deal with those kinds of supply disruptions and market disruptions, and they happen on an entirely different um, time constant than um, increasing production um, from from uh, you know d from drilling. So the the two are are, are linked together in, in in some people's minds. But if you sort of look at the propositions, they don't really have anything intellectually in common with each other. Yeah. One is saying. If you're going to release an amount of SPRO in the future, we want a guaranteed increase of X amount. I, um, unless you had an entirely command and control economy for oil and gas production, I don't even know how you would do that. How, how would how would the Secretary of Interior said, okay, you're gonna you're gonna have you know not 9.2 percent more production on federal land next year? I mean that's that you know the production is is the amount produced is is actually principally affected by the price you know, on NYMEX, right? And people look at at, at what the future prices are going to be, and then and everybody in our sort of private sector, um, you know, system, you know, makes their their um, oil and gas production uh, exploration plans accordingly. If we had a national oil company, you might be able to make a deal like that work, but I, we, but we don't. Okay, other questions. Well, I'm a, the second oh, I'm question sorry. was yes. the uh, counter cyclical subsidy issue, and I think, you know, that's been something that people have talked about for a long time, and I think even maybe the National Commission on Energy Policy talked about counter cyclical subsidies. There's a lot of appeal to that. Of course, the question is, where do you set the number? And if the and if you think, well, and and then the threshold question, of course, is that many in the industry don't consider most of those to be subsidies anyway. They consider them to be tax uh, provisions that apply more broadly. And in fact, you know, there's an argument about the the, the couple of the biggest ones whether they whether they, they really qualify as an oil and gas subsidy. But in, in terms of if you can narrow that and say, yes, these are specifically designed to, to boost domestic oil and gas production, it sure seems logical that the higher the price, the less the incentive that's needed and the, therefore less the subsidy. But uh, And maybe that's a play at some point when we get to this tax reform debate that Jennifer talked about where there's clearly a desire to start cleaning up the tax code, that maybe goes counter to cleaning it up, but it provides a glide path um, that particularly some of the independents might be um, in a position of, of, of needing or wanting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly an intellectually interesting proposal, and if um, you know Congress was populated all by MIT economists, I suspect that would be the system we would have. Right. Also, I just say we have fiddled around for years on both the tax code, on regulation of price, with trying to find a mechanism to have an impact on the price or when the prices do things to have other things. And my gut instinct after trying a few of those is rarely does it work and rarely does it pass the Congress at the end of the day. They're clever designs to come up with how I can play you, placate you who want a subsidy for your production and it's uh, and placate me, I'm, I'm just using this example, for, for saying you don't need the subsidy in a high price economy. So what do we do? We try to find this intellectual, but it's a creation, an artificial creation of policy that I'm not sure is sustainable in a very complex market situation in which the fa factors that affect why the price gets set are all over the lot and whether you're off cycle, you say, well, be counter cyclical, or what is the damn cycle? Uh, you know, <laughs> you've got to uh, identify that. And, and, and by the way, when we tried real price controls, 
I don't think there's anybody sitting around today, I hope, that thinks that was a successful policy for the United States. It was under Nixon, right? It started under Nixon, yeah. yeah. It was part of the anti-inflation policy, but it was kept because of the oil crisis of the, of the 73s on oil. Of course, gas started in the 1950s. <coughs> okay, other questions? Congressman Walker. Here comes the microphone. I wonder if the panel would talk a little bit about the government structure as being a problem in all of this, and particularly congressional structure. Uh, most of the discussion here today and the discussion in Congress comes in a vertical sense. When we talk about energy, we only talk about it in terms of fuels mm -hmm. uh, or things that directly impact energy, and yet most of the changes in energy right now and the things that uh, David was referring to come as a result of other things. I mean, the internal combustion engine has been uh, a, uh, definitely changed by electronics and uh, particularly by computerization. It has made it far more, far more efficient. Uh, if you take a look at um, uh, the future, uh, the Google uh, uh, autonomous car is likely to make the highways vastly more efficient and uh, result in, in energy changes. Or if uh, you look uh, at uh, moving, uh, David also mentioned the, the hydrogen economy, if you look at the uh, uh, fuel cell, it's 66 percent efficient as opposed to 18 percent efficient for internal combustion engines. And so th th there, are, there are developments taking place in other sectors that Congress doesn't get to because structurally it doesn't fit into their committee uh, patterns. And even in, in the government itself, it doesn't fit. It's, it's not necessarily a Department of Energy question. It's a question somewhere else. And I'm just wondering if, if you would comment on whether or not energy policy really involves a restructuring of uh, the way in which we deal with, with patterns, not vertically anymore, but horizontally. Good, we've got two people that used to be at uh, DOE as well as in Congress, and you've seen and worked within structures. Are they adaptable? Uh, do they need changing? Well, I, I'll start, I guess. The, um, so in the, in the Congress, of course, you do have this interesting selection of committees, and it's, and it's different between the House and, and the Senate. And, the, and uh, the, the other thing that's always, you know, so, so the committee I worked for as environmental legislation, which, you know, substantially impacts energy production, uh, distribution, and use, um, the, the, we also had the highway bill, which the transportation sector, significant energy user, but we don't really talk about energy, you know, we talk about these sort of riders on the transportation bill this year. Well, why isn't energy policy actually part of the transportation debate as opposed to something that we're using on the Republican side to extract concessions uh, for? Similarly, um, at, uh, at DOE, the, you've got the fossil energy, the nuclear energy, the energy efficiency and renewable energy um, that are supposed to be overseen by an undersecretary who somehow magically brings it all together and, and, and balances all the, all the concerns. When, when I was in the Bush administration, we had something called the Climate Change Technology Program that was supposed to be working across literally a dozen agencies that had R&D and clean energy technology, which is sort of astounding uh, that, that there are that many, but in, in fact that there are. Um, it, it seems to me um, that, uh, um, well, I'll just say, my, the place I, I was most recently at, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, has an energy project that uh, Trent Lott and Byron Dorgan and Bill Riley and General Jim Jones co-chair. And General Jones, having most recently been National Security Advisor with a strong interest in energy, has a very strongly held view that the organization is part of the problem, and particularly on the R&D and project delivery side. And so I would uh, urge people to sort of pay attention to what that organization comes out with because he's giving a lot of thought to optimizing the organizational structure uh, so as to facilitate the kind of cross-fertilization and uh, propagation then of new energy technologies in a much more uh, efficient fashion. It could hardly be less efficient than it is uh, today. Um, but what the, what the right answer is at the end of the day, uh, I, I couldn't begin to say. Uh, this, is, this is the problem. Uh, it, it's easy to see that there's dysfunction in this organization because of the way we've divided jurisdictions. By the way, most corporations and most universities face the same problem. Uh, uh, they have different techniques for disciplining inside them, but they have the same practical problem as how do you divide up the subject area 
in, in, in bite sizes that somebody can actually work with. Because in one way, you ought to just have the whole Congress deal with all of the energy issues and put them in one big barrel. But there is nobody there, and none of us were competent enough to handle all of that uh, and to have the knowledge base you would hope would be had. So you have to divide it up. And when you get to that point, it gets hard. Now, this is where presidential leadership has an opportunity to play a big role and can function. And I would give both uh, President uh, uh, Bush's a great deal of credit on this, and, uh, and the Carter administration as well, because they did the background work before they made their proposals. And this is not the normal way in Washington uh, for some many occasions. Uh, in terms of the Cheney Task Force, what people forget about it is what it really did. It, it had a legislative set of proposals, but what it had was what any smart administration ought to have, a set of guidelines for everybody they appointed throughout the, the executive branch, which had all pieces of, of the, the policy, so that at least there was some opportunity of coherence if you, if you enforce discipline out of the White House and out of OMB on the executive branch, because the executive branch has the same problem as the Congress. So the problem becomes how do you overcome this, and I think the way you overcome it is through presidential leadership, it's through congressional leadership, it's through uh, superior committee chairman and, and others who can play this role, but there's no magic in it. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question it is a problem, but man, when you start figuring out how to make it work, we had, uh, Tip O'Neill, I was on the uh, Energy Committee, Select Energy Committee in 1977, uh, 78, that was appointed by the Speaker. T Tip O'Neill, at the end of the day, said, I'll never do that again, <laughs> uh, kind of proposition. Uh, I, I think it probably did have the function it was supposed to have. But remember this, part of the question is, we talked. I talked about the difference in goals. The difference in policy techniques is huge. So if you believe that the tax code is the technique, <laughs> you know, well, then you're in the Ways and Means Committee. If you believe regulating cafe standards and regulating the auto industry instead of taxing them, uh, you're in the Commerce Committee. But how you get those two uh, the choices, and that was the choice back in my 1975, the revenue, the uh, committee said, let's have a gas guzzler tax, the revenue people did, and the Commerce Committee said, let's have a regulatory tax. And you can say, oh, well, they were just doing because that was in their jurisdiction. Uh, both parties, both seem to be rather true believers about the approach. But I do wonder about how some of these things may come about organically. I mean, when the Department of Homeland Security was set up, if you were to look at a 2012, and I were to tell you the most important piece of legislation that people are looking at pertaining to that agency right now is cybersecurity, you would think I was nuts. You, would, you might not even think it's their juris You might not even think it would be under that agency, and that that is um, that's the next key piece of legislation moving through Congress that affects yeah. that that agency. And that, and that, by the way, affects the electric utility industry yeah. hugely. Uh, kind of proposition now is who should have governance over that question is a hard problem. By the way, uh, I have very f seldom heard people say that the Department of Homeland Security has been a massive organizational success in bringing all those things under one roof. Now, maybe I missed it. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Sean Sullivan, a reporter with SNL Energy. Um, both DOE and FERC are considering LNG exports right now, and they both, uh, you can't predict exactly what they're gonna do, but seem open to the idea of letting the market decide whether those projects go forward. Do you think Congress, uh, and I'm thinking of Markey in particular, uh, will take any steps to, um, to, to say that we won't let the market uh, determine what LNG export projects so go for. the U.S. Liquid, liquefied natural gas should yes. be exported to other countries. Right. Anyone? Well, I, I guess I, I have a hard time imagining a prohibition passing and being enacted into law. I think that the, the, there's a widespread support um, for allowing the you know, the private parties, all they're seeking is permits as far as I don't understand. They're not looking for loan guarantees. They're not looking for grants. They're not looking for anything other than a permit, uh, which is under the authority of the department uh, to issue. And uh, I'd be shocked, I guess, if um, the Republican House um, were to pass uh, or, or even the current Senate. Uh, were to pass a prohibition, but of course I defer to Bob on this. On this well, um, um, Mr. Markey's in the House, and so I don't know much about 
having Senate people sort of pontificate about the House is a good way of getting in trouble. Um, um, pontificate about the Senate. Yeah, pontificate <laughs> about the Senate. I'll just po maybe pontificate about the issue. Um, cl clearly, um, you know, the, the shell gas revolution, the shell gas boom is, is, you know, as many people, my colleagues have said here, is a real, you know, um, milestone event, um, um, you know, changes a lot of assumptions. And one of the questions going forward, of course, is, as, as Dave pointed out, is, you know, how much um, shell gas are we actually going to see out of the shell gas revolution? It will depend on uh, a little bit on technology. It will depend a little bit on the price. It will depend a little bit on uh, these regulatory and local impacts, right? So, you know, that's very much a, um, a, a work in progress to see exactly how that is all going to play out. And, of course, one of the uncertainties is on the other side. That's on the supply side. On the demand side, um, you have a number of constituencies with a great uh, amount at stake in all of this. You have the electric utility industry. You know, they look at the shale gas revolution as being transformative to their industry because it allows them to reduce their carbon footprint in a very economic way um, and a very reliable way. Um, so they're very interested. I will tell you that, you know, a lot of these uh, shale gas plays are associated with what are called natural gas liquids. These are little higher chemical cousins of methane, ethane, mm -hmm. propane, and the like. I will tell you that the chemical processing industry in the United States sees that as transformative for their industry. Um, you know, back in the 80s, the chemical processing industries was the second largest export industry in this country after aircraft. Um, in the early 2000s, that was not true at all. Um, they were really... Um, looking to um, you know liquidate them their 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 themselves. I mean, obviously, the, I remember Dow Chemical was entertaining seriously a proposal by the Kuwaitis to buy Dow, just so they could have um, a, a secure source of um, hydrocarbon feedstock. All that has turned around, and so that's another constituency that is looking at shale gas as being you know essential to their future. And we are seeing for the first time. Um, you know, significant proposals to expand um, petrochemical facilities in the United States um, because of the shale gas. Um, obviously, you have the folks in the transportation sector who are very interested in using shale gas as a, an alternative to gasoline, and you can see that that could be transformative if, if another slice of the pie chart of where we get our transportation fuels, you know, is now no longer dependent on oil, which might need to be imported, but is dependent on natural gas domestically produced. That's potentially transformative to that sector. Um, so you see, a, a, and of course, then you have the folks who, uh, who are producing the gas who sort of see the opportunities to export it to uh, other places in the world where it will fetch a much higher price. That's potentially transformative to those companies and to the, the localities in which they're based. So you have um, around this issue a lot of people on the demand side um, who are looking at this and who are commercial competitors to each other to some extent. Um, depending on, on the size of the resource. And I think that the great unknown at this point is how much gas is there? Can it satisfy all four of those constituencies? And maybe there's a couple more I don't even know about, um, you know, um, at reasonable cost. And if it does, then I think that the concerns about exporting it will, um, you know, not be very great. If at some point there is a determination that there's actually not enough gas to go around and that not all four of those constituencies or other constituencies can be satisfied um, in terms of their commercial plans for what they would like to do if they could buy some of that natural gas, then I think you may see a conflict. But I think it's too soon to tell. And, and I don't think that, you know, you know, it seems that you could sort of think about this in sort of the extreme case. So, you know, if you exported one molecule of, of shale gas, would it make a difference to the market? No. If you exported 99.9% .9 of the molecules, would it make a difference to the market? Yes. So obviously there's something between one and 99.9%. .9 uh, that makes a difference. Are we likely to, um, you know, get anywhere to where exports actually do have market moving potential in the United States? I think that's very much an unknown question. That's exactly what the department is trying to sort out in all this. So I think there's m many more questions than there really are answers at this point. I think it will depend on the ultimate size of the resource and then the ultimate desires of the people on the demand side um, and, and how they can all be accommodated. I think that's what's going to tell the tale. Yeah, I just add to that that I, I think that um, you know, Dave's right. I don't think anything's going to happen now uh, and whatnot. But I think what he's just laid out is you, you've got huge investments that are underway in the utility sector, mm -hmm. in the uh, 
chemical industry and whatnot, and at some point if they feel threatened on the supply side, their, their uh, opposition to government intervention on these kind of questions evaporates, uh, and they will be uh, powerful constituencies, and you don't know which Republican and which Democrat will suddenly uh, find that as, uh, as a compelling issue. The way it's being raised now is ideologically as sort of as the consumer versus uh, uh, this whole thing. I don't think that's reaching anybody because I don't think many people are listening <laughs> or, or aware of what's going on. But we, if you get down to these more serious cases of what is the real supply constraint and, and, and what investment's already been made <laughs> and or is under or on the drafting board, then there's a lot at stake. If there are no more hands, I'm going to just ask a quick question for uh, one thing from each of our panelists, and that is, in the 2012 presidential campaign, will any energy issue uh, rise to prominence, whether it's legitimate or not? If you tell me what the price I'm going to be paying for gasoline at my um, local pump in September, I'll know the answer to that question. I think uh, it's going to. Same with you? Yeah, I, I think the administration may be lucky that the price increase came early. And it may evaporate, but there's no predicting. Okay. I think I think Keystone has already, well, Keystone and that'll and that'll stay it. until it's resolved one way or the other. I think. Jennifer, um, we had a robust debate in a meeting about s three months ago, where a poll came out showing that Obama's numbers were tanking, and everyone in the room said, "Well, gas prices just went up." And there were a number of people who were outraged by this and thought this was an impossible thing to believe. And it turned out that none of them owned a car. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, you, <laughs> you're all metro riders. So, uh, Congressman, you mentioned uh, price as a driver, and um, there, I don't think there's any consumer good that's more price sensitive than fuel. And so, I would concur with uh, the panelists. Okay, very good. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. <clears throat> and please join us for a reception out in the atrium room. Uh, actually, actually, I, right now. I didn't. I didn't you do, I didn't, I said, okay, well, great, I don't, need to, I don't need to cover that, I don't need to explain that, and I don't need to cover that, so. I, I, I thought I'd, okay. Well, 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 I understand. I appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. It was fine. I just was able to skate in on the, skate in on the, on the, just the reinforcement.